If you would, you can turn over to the book of Job, chapter 1. Just a minute or two, we're going to read one verse. One verse, verse 21. Both of the lessons this morning were kind of born out of the, the recent trips that uh, we, we have made. And along the way, as uh, is life, uh, anytime we get uh, out of our comfort zone, we tend to be uh, open uh, to some of the greatest uh, of life lessons uh, as they come to us. I want you to imagine the worst day you've ever had. W- what does that look like? And, and maybe you look back on your life and you can't think of any day that stands out good for you. Good for you. Uh, and uh, that's just an amazing thing. But what is the worst day that you, you, you ever had? How did you get through that day? Now, maybe it was a day in which you were, like we talked about this morning, called to examine yourself. For you knew something was kind of amiss in the kingdom of self. And you had to go in, dive deep, examine and figure out what that thing was. And had to stand in the mirror and look at that person that you really didn't want to see. Maybe that was, if not the worst, one of your worst days. You see, we all have bad days from time to time. And when we travel, especially to, to Mexico... I'm reminded of this point. In just a little bit, <clears throat> you're going to get to see some of the places in which these folks live. And the hardship that they have each and every day. At least the last two years that we've gone there, both of the homes that we've built have been built for families where the husbands are not there most of the time. They are actually traveling great distances just to find work, and it's typically back-breaking, difficult work, so that they can come home for one or two days, maybe on the weekends, and be with their family. Most of us don't have to endure that type of separation. Most of us don't have to endure that, that type of hardship. But we all have worse days, do we not? Yeah. We receive that diagnosis or we hear about a family member lost or maybe suffer financial setback or or some other thing comes to us. How do we get through that? How do we make our way past it? And I got to thinking about that, having seen some of the hardships of the people in Mexico, and I thought, you know, there's no better example than, than Job. And I went and I started reading the book of Job, and I just love the book of Job. I don't know about you, but it's one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book in the Old Testament after the wisdom literature. But it's just an amazing book. There are some perplexing things about it that will challenge the mind. There are some things that are just very straightforward and yet profound at the same time. And the more I read, the more I began to realize that chapter 1, verse 21, is a summation of all that we could say that, I, I don't know, is, is divine uh, about Job's reaction and kind of plots for us the bullet points uh, of why he is called a righteous man. Chapter 1, verse 21. Chapter 1, verse 21. <clears throat> Most of us know the story. Have you considered my servant Job, God talking to Satan? And we know that eventually God is going to allow Satan to test him, to tempt him. And eventually it gets to the point where the only thing that Satan is not allowed to do is kill him. Take his life. But he took everything else from him. He took his family. I mean, all of his children. He took his wealth. And even his wife came to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? But I want you to notice chapter 1, verse 21. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Five life lessons, I believe, are given here, and they're pretty straightforward. Profound statements for us to think about when we have our own difficult times, when we have to do our own self-examination, when we maybe aren't in a position that we really want 
to be in. Lesson number one, naked I came from my mother's womb. Now, you are a product of God's creation. And when you came into this world, you weren't given the keys to a shiny new car and a condo on the beach and a million dollars in the bank. Life is not all about the substance that we can accumulate and the possessions that we might have. And, and yet, isn't it the case that when you look at people and many of their problems, it doesn't really resolve or it doesn't really revolve around their personal spiritual journey. It tends to revolve around their stuff. Their stuff. Oh man, we lost it. And it's okay. It may seem tragic, I guess. But in the grand scheme of things, in the face of eternity, is it really all that important? Are the things going to gain you anything in a spiritual sense? Are they really going to help you move forward in attaining that goal that God wants you to attain? I mean, the last time I checked, Paul, when he wrote about this subject, said, this one thing I do, right? And you, you remember what he says next, next about this one thing that he, he does? Setting aside, you know, all these uh, weight, like we're encouraged in, in the book of Hebrews, right? What does he do, Dennis? He presses toward the mark, which is what? Well, you know, there's a lot of things kind of in there in between, but essentially it's Christ, right? He keeps his eye on the prize, and the prize is Jesus. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say, look, this one thing I do, I accumulate as many possessions as I can so I can stand upon them when the judgment comes in order to reach eternity. The Bible says that nowhere. So some of the problems that we have... Some of the difficulties that we have, some of the life lessons that we need to learn is God telling us, look, it's time to have a sale. It's time to get rid of these things and stuff and, and perhaps idols that we've created for ourselves. Naked you came into this world. Lesson number two. Lesson number two. Naked I shall return. Naked I shall return. One of the things that we did when we were on our personal vacation part is we went to cemeteries. Now, that seems sounds kind of like a weird thing, right? But um, I don't know how you feel, but cemeteries are beautiful places, at least where I come from. They're peaceful, they're surrounded by trees, they're well kept, and in some of them there are these mausoleums dating all the way back to near the founding of our country uh, and it's just it's just beautiful but we go there for personal reasons the first one that we visited was where our daughter is buried and we stood next to her grave hearing the babbling of the brook and the tree behind and we thought about the brevity of life we hadn't been there in 10 years and it was an amazing moment for us next cemetery we visited was my sister's St. Clairsville, Ohio, drove past, you can't miss her headstone. It's got a big picture of her laser etched on the front of it. Uh, and it's a pretty amazing thing. But it's on the top of this hill. And as we stood next there, as we drove past and were there by her grave, we could look down over the hill and see the beauty of the scenery and it's just an amazing thing. I like cemeteries. But the reason I like cemeteries really doesn't have much to do with the headstones is because they're a reminder of just how brief life is. You know, Solomon once said this. He said, it is better to go to the house of mourning than it is to the house of mirth. You know, it's good to be joyous and happy, and, you know, he doesn't say not to do those things. But it's also good and better for us to be reminded that life is short. You see, as I stand there in those two places, taking up my residence for a moment's time in these cemeteries, I think, am I living my life so I can go and see these people? So I can be with them? Being naked, we came into this world, naked, we'll leave. We've got just a very short time here. 
and we don't get to take anything with us but the treasure that we've laid up in eternity. Number three, life lesson. The Lord gave. The Lord gave. Now, now this is one that I always like to talk about. How many times do you find yourself having gone through your day not really thinking about God and how he's blessed you in just those moments of time you had in that single day? And how many times do we get to the end of the day and find out as we hopefully think about it, I didn't give God praise for anything. I didn't kneel in prayer to thank him or to make requests even. I didn't even give thought to, to God. And yet he is not only our creator, right? He is our sustainer. Okay? It's because of him that you have that day to go through. In him we what? Live, move, have our being. Live, move, have our being. There's not a day, there's not a minute, there's not a second. There's not a fraction of that second minute or day that goes by that he is not your creator. The Lord gives because he's the giver of all things. And therefore, each and every day that we have, no matter how good or how bad it may seem to us, it is given to you by God. And you need to find the godliness in it, the blessedness in it. I'm a firm believer in no matter how tragic your circumstance may be, there is always goodness to find in it. And I'm telling you what, first time I went to Mexico was one of those times that proved that point to me. Here are these people and I'm telling you, they, they have it way, way worse than we have. They have far fewer resources. Uh, and uh, live in conditions that make most people walk around with a cringe on their face for the first two hours you're there. But you never see them frown. They always seem happy. And these people who have nothing are, are willing to spend everything to simply say thanks because you build them a house. Meat's expensive there. And, the, and it's not something they get on a regular basis. And that's why on Wednesday when we meet with them, that we as Americans provide for them a meal that centerpiece is some type of meat. Now in the past it was hot dogs. This year it was hamburgers. It was much better. <laughs> in, my opinion, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, they loved it. They loved it. They don't get meat. Three years ago, no, maybe it was four years ago. I think it was Josh's first year. The woman of the house spent all morning getting all this stuff ready out there. And I thought she was just making a fire. And Josh and I were building the banyo out back. And, and we were just sort of occasionally watching what she was doing. She cooked up enough fried chicken for each and every person on our team, about 16 to 18 people, to have a full meal. And that's all we want. Even though many of them were reluctant to eat that chicken... It was probably the best chicken I've ever had in my life. You know, that's not a person who's, woe is me. Look at my poor circumstances. Look at where I am. How could I possibly, God, it's your, you know, that's not that kind of person. This is a person who is able to find the joy and the life in things. Life lesson number four. Just like the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. <coughs> the Lord takes away. Why do you think God took things away from Job or allowed Job's things to be taken. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why that, that happens. One of them you can see in other places. And that is God simply trying to teach us a lesson. You don't need that thing. I think it's the reason why, you know, or, or to have us, you know, prove do we love him more than the thing, whatever it might be. It's one of the reasons why I think Abram was called to take Isaac to the top of that mountain, put that knife in his hand and raise it above his head. Do you love him more than me? I think it's one of the reasons that Joseph found himself in a pit. I think it's one of the reasons why David, even though he had been anointed king, found himself fleeing from cave to cave to cave to cave, so destitute that he had to break into the temple and eat the showbread. 
it's all the same reason. God's trying to teach us something. The Lord gives and, and the Lord takes away, sometimes because we need to have things taken away. But you'll notice that God doesn't take things away without replacing them with something better. At the end of the story, do you remember how many times or how many fold more Job received? Tenfold, I believe. Tenfold. He had more kids. He had more money. He had more crops. He was more blessed. Now, go back and look at the description of Job at the beginning of the book. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. There's nobody else like him on earth. And now he's ten times better? That's a pretty amazing thing. Pretty amazing thing. You know, the early church didn't spread beyond the borders of Jerusalem until they were persecuted. And they were forced to flee Jerusalem. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And typically is for our greater good. And the final life lesson. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Do we sing God's praises? I mean, if he's providing these things for us, including these life lessons and these valuable teachings, are we singing his praise? Do our hearts pour forth with thanksgiving? I'm just always impressed by the, the Psalms. And just how often and how long and, and how many times the psalmists talk about praising God. You know, like those passages where, you, you know, I was overjoyed. I, I, I could barely contain myself when they said, let us go in to the household of God. I mean, are we that excited to sing God's praise? Man, it ought to be that way. Now, sometimes life gets you down. But we are seriously mistaken if we think that we have to wait around for things to start going right to sing God's praises. And dare I say, if we switch the order of those two and sang God's praises, then the second one would get a whole lot better. We would find ourselves not perceiving life as being in as bad a shape as we think it is at times. Because giving God praise has this wonderful way of, of centering us, uh, of being able to focus our minds and put us in, in a position where we're thinking uh, about right things. Who was it? It was Paul, right? I believe it was Paul that talked about whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. And he goes on and whatsoever and mentions all these positive things. And then he says, think on these things at the same time encouraging us to understand that such wisdom comes from God. So we think on the things of God and it's going to improve our situation whether or not the actual physical nature of the situation changes. I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5. Beginning with verse 6, he talks about humble yourselves. You know, have a sense of humility about you, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And then notice what he says here in, in verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God cares for you. I mean, naked you came into this world and naked you're going to leave. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But at the end of the day, blessed be the name of the Lord because as Peter says, he cares for you. And all of these things are for your good. Well, maybe you're here tonight and maybe you're having difficulty. Maybe the difficulty is the decision to give yourself to Christ. Have you heard his word? Do you believe? 
You're willing to repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins so you can rise and walk in newness of life? Maybe that's not where you are. Maybe sometime in the past you've made that commitment, but now you're struggling. You're here tonight, and you need to make some need known. We encourage you to do so while we stand and sing.